Welcome everybody to the New Economic Rights Alliance, a very special edition today. I am now speaking to the four candidates on the Ubuntu party elect election roll coming up on May 7th in the South African elections. And I'm very happy to be sitting with you guys tonight. Thank you for all coming. I'll introduce you one by one. But the purpose of this exercise is to really get to grips with what the Ubuntu party is about. We've seen utopian ideals. Uh, the three particular ones I want to talk about tonight, the, the, the policies that you're speaking about are obviously the money system and the people's bank, the energy issue and the food crisis. And these three things seem to be able to be solved re relatively simply according to the Ubuntu party. So for those that want to start to really understand that there's a seriousness behind this Ubuntu structure, this is really what the purpose of the, of the interview is. So let me introduce everybody uh, one by one. Michael Tillinger, founder, welcome. Hello, Scotty. Nice to be speaking to you again. Excellent. Louise Clark, co-founder. Hi, Scott. Hi. Excellent, excellent, Louise. Thank you. Stephen Goodson. Hi, Scott. Nice For to be with you. Great, great. Former director of the South African Reserve Bank, which is always nice to throw that around because it does, uh, it does add a lot of credibility and particular experience, uh, especially when we talk about the money system. Great to be with you, Stephen. And Thank Sid you. Orgain. Well, hi, Scott, and uh, hi to everybody else out there. <laughs> good, good. AKA, the city that never sleeps. One of the most researched people I've, uh, well-researched people I've ever met. So, guys, really, thank you very much. Let, let's kick this straight away. This, the purpose is not to go into the background too much of Ubuntu and what the philosophy is, because you can read that in Michael's book. Uh, you can get it from the ubuntu.org.za website. It's all over the place. So let's start to, to tackle these issues one by one and, and hit this right where it's supposed to be. And I want to I wanna start with the, um, the banking side, because that's something that's, that's topical at the moment. The TV commercials talk about the People's Bank. Uh, they talk about this ability to be able to fix a broken money system. Michael, just take us through this very quickly. How do you propose to do this? I mean, what is wrong with our banking system? first of all, and how are you going to propose to, to sort this problem out? Thanks, Cody. Um, you know, before I launch into that, I just want to pick up on one little thing just to, um, uh, to maybe take this conversation into a slightly more uh, um, broader base um, kind of area because you started this whole introduction by saying, um, using the word utopian. And, and I'll, you know, I'm finding it quite interesting because... Uh, a few people have called us, you know, utopian ideas and so forth, and I and I, I get a smile on my face every time I hear that. It's as if, as if th thinking about a utopian society is a bad thing, and it, it's just amazing how poisoned we have become, how poisoned our minds and our systems and our brains and the, and the way we think about life has become. We seem to have been conditioned into believing and and thinking that we have to suffer, we have to struggle. There is no prosperity for humanity. We have to have hard lives and live in misery and somehow just survive from month to month. And utopian ideas are something so far-fetched that we'll never attain it. Well, I believe the opposite. I believe, and this is really fundamentally what everyone that is in the Ubuntu movement globally in more than 198 countries now and, uh, and now in the Ubuntu party in South, South Africa, I do believe that all of us firmly believe in, in the fact that People and living, breathing human beings should live utopian lives of abundance and not scrounge around and live in misery from month to month and week to week, just somehow surviving. So yeah, let's no, get, absolutely. Let's get, okay, get so I see, out, I, see you know? where you, I see where you're going with this. You want, to, you want to sort of take on the whole sort of over, overarching ideology. You know, a lot of people will say, well, this just is not practical. And I think that's really the purpose of this interview today. And I'm looking forward to hearing everybody, you know, all four of you's input in this, because ultimately your average person is going to look at this and go and say, well, it's just not practical to feed the majority of people in this country. It's just not practical to yeah. be able to give everybody cheap energy. And it's just not practical to have an alternative money system because if all the banks are too big to, to fail. So I hear exactly what you're saying. And, and, and it, it is possible. And that's what I want to talk about today, Michael. I want to know know why it's possible. I want people to be able to listen to this and go, these Ubuntu people are not crazy nutcases, but they've actually got a well thought out structure. Yeah. And, and so just to, just to uh, add to what you said there, all of the above is possible. It is possible to feed everybody with very little 
money and resources because the money and the resources that that uh, should be available for this kind of activity is there and uh, it is practical and is possible to provide f alternative and virtually free and eventually free electricity and energy it is practical to to provide uh, ho housing and security for all the people and food and and health care health care that is actually um, far more than just um, treating the symptoms, but actually goes much deeper into understanding what what um, healing is all about, and all these things. You know w w what you said right up front. We are f there are four individuals, and we're just the four people that put our names up as candidates for the Ubuntu Party. We are all in our individual ways well researched. Um, we are all scientists. You can say in our own respective fields, because scientists mean just somebody that's very knowledgeable. Uh, someone with knowledge, and and we bring this collective um, knowledge and research to the table and to this political platform, uh, which I still loathe to say, but but uh, we bring this philosophy of Ubuntu and contributionism into this political arena so we can share it with the people, so that we can bring the good news, be the bearer of good news, and tell everyone that it, not only is it possible for us to live in a utopian society, but we have worked out steps and and feasible and practical uh, ways of actually achieving it. So and that's, and get, that, that's where we want to go with to this. To get back to your question about the banking, um, very, I guess one sentence <coughs> answer for, for that is that the entire global banking industry is a fraudulent structure that was created as pretty much a tool of enslavement over the human race over every country, the people of every country, the entire global banking structure with its supply of money, the way it works, is controlled by a small number of people that run pretty much uh, all of this activity from Switzerland, from Basel, Switzerland, and Stephen Goodson will have a lot more to say about that. And to overcome the, the problems and the misery that the people find themselves in on a daily basis, we have to go to the root of the problem, and the root of the problem sits with the supply and the creation of money that is supplied by private companies, a private company pretty much so, um, uh, called the, the, the Bank of, for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, and, and the control of the entire global financial systems. Now, how that is going to impact <clears throat> on um, providing, uh, changing it, is, is virtually we can change and alleviate this, this uh, control overnight by stopping this exclusive right of these banking families and, and the South African Reserve Bank that is controlled by the BIS in Switzerland, um, by stopping that and, and allowing or creating an alternative which we call the People's Bank, which is owned by the people and the government of the people and provides money for the people by the people. And Stephen Goodson has a lot more detail uh, on that. And um, this, this will provide virtually 100% employment. It will stimulate every possible imaginary sect, imaginable sector of our lives and our society, uh, providing abundance that we cannot imagine right now. Okay, and, uh, I've, 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 and that's pretty much it. I get, I, I, we, we understand, right? A, a, a brilliant idea. I've done the research, many much research as well as you know, into the banking system, and I agree with you um, up to up to a, yo, not even up to a point. I, I completely agree with you. But in terms of the practicalities, now we're in a very interesting situation here because now we've got Stephen here, and Stephen, I'd like you to to tell me. I mean, you know, Michael Tellinger over the last few years has been mm. he's been painting the the South African Reserve Bank as being a, a dark, sinister place that's secretly controlled with, you know, all these banking families, banking elites pr producing money out of nothing. Um, you worked in those dark halls, supposedly, for many, many years. You were there. You arrived at meetings. You went there. You were a director of this institution. Is Michael smoking something that he would like to make legal if he becomes president? Or is tell me about what's, what's really going on there from somebody who's been inside it. Okay, Scott. Um... Before, we, uh, before we, have a, uh, we have a look at the Reserve Bank, I think we do need to get some perspective. And I always find it useful to, to go back in history. Otherwise, we, you know, we sort of confuse ourselves with the current circumstances and we don't understand the roots of the problem. 
Now, if we go back to uh, when South Africa was first settled in 1652, uh, at that time we had the, the the settlement was uh, started by the Dutch East India Company. It was controlled by 17 directors. The year is 17, most of whom were bankers. And so bankers that, founded this nation. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And the, um, in other words, usury became part of the fabric of, of South Africa from 1652. Usury being the charging of interest on money. Yes, of, of uh, the private creation of money. And uh, so we've had this system right, you know, since since the the, the first settlement, white settlement, and uh, we've had various sort of uh, um, you might say benchmark dates when the, um, uh, for example, in 1910, when uh, many of the English speaking people thought they had attained freedom and uh, were able to rule themselves. Then we had it in 1948, the Afrikaners thought they had obtained freedom. And, uh, you know, we're a free people. And again, we had in 1994 when the majority of the people in South Africa also thought that they'd obtained freedom. But that freedom was entirely illusory. The banking system has remained unchanged since 1652. So this wow. system of, of but debt slavery. But that's a, state, that's, a, that's a powerful statement. I mean, since six, yes. you've, just, you've just said now, at 1652, the, the, mm. the country was founded by bankers, essentially, which you said yes. of the Committee of 17, and it hasn't yes. changed to this day. It that's has not changed one direction. In fact, it's got worse. And uh, the, the first act of sort of a, a tightening the noose occurred in uh, 1920 when the, uh, the um, what was known as the Banking and Currency Bill was put forward to establish the South African Reserve Bank. And they, they replicated more or less the Bank of England, and it was put forward by a chap by the name of Henry Struckosh, who had uh, mining investments in this country. He was a friend of Yanni Smuts, and he drafted the uh, sort of basic report. Uh, it was vigorously debated in Parliament, but for a, they rushed it through in a very short period of time, six weeks, and both government and opposition MPs were very upset about this. They said, we need to have more time. And uh, there were various proposals, one of them by General Herzog, that the uh, uh, proposal for a central bank should be uh, delayed for at least two years so we could, they could gather more evidence and see whether it was a, a really worthwhile institution. But it was pushed through and it was voted in all the parties except the Labour Party, who were in common with Labour parties throughout the, uh, the Commonwealth at that time, was aware of, of what was happening. And they put up a vigorous uh, opposition. They explained that uh, a state bank would be a, a, you know, um, a more preferable and that it would um, provide the basis for a, a growing economy and without the control of the uh, private banks. But they were voted down, and the voting was about 69 votes to 23. The uh, Labour Party then formed a coalition with the National Party in 1924 after the uh, um, rights on the mines on the Wifardus front. And regrettably, they did not uh, include a, a clause that the, <coughs> that the central bank would be revisited. So it continued until 1944, because when they uh, established the bank, it, they gave it a mandate for 25 years in which to print banknotes. And then that was, uh, that expired in 1944. Uh, 45. Okay, so Stephen, they, just, they, just for, for, the, for this is very interesting now. Yeah. What, what, the mandate was to produce banknotes, only banknotes. I mean, what is the purpose of a central bank? What, what are they doing without the central bank? What were we doing? How did they well, trade? Were they trading gold coins? Were they trading? No, no. Pri you know? Prior to 1920, we had the private banks, you know, like Standard and Barclays, and they would issue all the banknotes. And our coinage, we didn't have our own coinage, then it came from Britain at that time. And they would create the credit, uh, the banker's credit at interest. And uh, what changed in 1920 was that the, the Reserve Bank now issued the banknotes and, uh, and they also minted the coins. So they took uh, power and control over our currency at this time? Well, not really. They only took control of the banknotes. Um, today, banknotes only form about, banknotes and coins form about 6% of the uh, money supply. At that time, it was about 25%. 
so they had more you might say they had uh, um, uh, they didn't control more but they had they put they um produced more than uh, created more than money supplied as, as is compared to today um, can i just can i just come in here Stephen, quickly yes. i think what scott was suggesting there is 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 really um from a layperson's perspective, when he said they created all the currency, is that mm. they they were the exclusive ex, uh, institutions that had the right to create the money of the day, and and still remain so today. Uh, whether the money is in the form of bills or coins or simply credit uh, in in some fictitious bank account, this thing called credit that they create, and the you know the the uh, the different. Uh, fraudulent entries that they participate in uh, accounting, uh, double bookkeep, double entry bookkeeping and all the kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's really what Scotty was referring to because that's what yes. uh, what everybody listening to this. So basically, in, in essence, all these private banks since, since 1652, the money was in the hands of the creation of money with which for which people had to work and slave their lives away was exclusively in the hands of private banks and continues to be so today. Do you agree with that, Stephen? Yes, that is correct. But the, the Reserve Bank didn't create any money except for the for the, the banknotes and, and, and coin, and that's always been the situation. Uh, what else is there? Uh, I beg your pardon. What else is there? What other form of currency is there, or was there? No, well, there was bank credit, but it was created by the private banks, as uh, as it, the situation is today. Um, one other important event that also took place. Prior to the establishment of the Reserve Bank, that was in 1915, they introduced income tax. And the reason why they had to do that was in order to fund the interest on government loans, um, we have to tax the people. And the um, Government loans to who? Other central banks and other banks? No, no, the government borrows, borrows from, uh, from people who have money. Remember, the money has been created by the uh, private banks. So they they borrow from institutions, they borrow from the public. And in order to fund the interest on these loans, they had to introduce the income tax, which originally it was set at uh, people earning more than a thousand pounds, which was then quite a, a, a hefty salary. Um, and then it was and it was only supposed to be for one year. It was subject to you know to annual review, but that was all dropped. And then they lowered the uh, um, thresholds to eventually incorporate everyone. So, so prior to 1915, we were able to fund the the, the, the running of the country with just with uh, tariffs and customs dues and and stamp duties. That was sufficient, and we in fact built the entire infrastructure, all the railways, the harbours, the uh, uh, all the municipal buildings. Everything was done without uh, have, having an uh, income tax. So the income tax is there exclusively to service the, the interest which has to be paid to the bankers. It does not wow. go towards uh, you know, providing hospitals. I've heard this in people. America, that the statement as well, that, the in, that income tax, uh, uh, all the income tax, if you took up all the in- income tax paid in America, it would be enough, uh, it, it's, it's, it's barely enough to even pay the interest on, on the amount of debt. That is extraordinary, though. I mean, it's yeah. just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's frightening to think that income tax, which is a significant amount in this country today, it might yes. have only been for more than a thousand pounds back then, which was a su- yes. substantial amount of money. But income it affects people hugely. This is going to pay the interest on debt, which was ultimately created by bankers. Yes. Wow. Money. Okay. Cr- creating money out of thin air. That's right. Okay, so I'd just like to advance it a bit further now, back to, uh, up to 1944, when the, uh, they had the, res- the uh, amendment, uh, the Southern Reserve Bank Amendment Bill, and that was to uh, allow the Reserve Bank to create notes and coins in perpetuity. Uh, once again, there was a vehement opposition from the Labour Party and a few National Party members, and they once again put forward, uh, in particular in the Senate, uh, Senator Sidney Smith, a proposal for a state bank. And the, the, the Minister of Finance at that time was J.H. Uh, uh, Jan Hendrik Hofmeier, and he was a, sort of quite a haughty character, and he wouldn't entertain these proposals. And that is effectively the last time that any kind of state or people's bank w- was proposed in Parliament. But it has been proposed before, which which gives me 
warm fuzzies a little bit because again for mm. those people who are saying Ubuntu what's this nonsense about a people's bank it'll be stolen yes. by the government and how could you ever let them do it it should be in the hands of the corporations they know what they're doing what you're yes. saying though is this is not a new concept it's not some utopian new no, concept no. It was, it was proposed twice in, in 1920 and in 1944. And I, I've, I've read all the debates and it's, it was done in, in particular detail. They covered all the aspects of it uh, and they provided examples, uh, for example, uh, which I mentioned the, in the, uh, the housing loans at 0% uh, of New Zealand. Uh, you were in dire straits in the middle 1930s and managed to recover within three years, uh, reduce, uh, drastically reduce unemployment and house everyone. So um, there are numerous examples of it being effectively applied. So there's e also international examples of where this people bank, people's bank has, wor has worked as well. It's not just, again, they're, they're this, this is not a, a model. Again, this is no. why I'm, I keep bringing this up because I want people listening to this to understand that, that this no. is something that's, that's a genuine part of our history. And is anyone doing it today? Well, only on a limited scale, they're doing it in North Dakota, uh, yes, where they, they have a... a, a a state bank which uh, provides cheap loans mainly for farmers, uh, also for students, and um, they um, it, the the state bank runs in, in cooperation with the private banks, and they um, enable the country to, the the state to uh, keep unemployment at a very low level, below four percent, and they've had a permanent budget surplus, uh, whereas. Um, North Dakota, Montana, the only states in the United States that are having experienced a budget surplus. So it's, it's been very successfully employed there, and there are about 20 other states which are seriously considering uh, in, uh, introducing uh, state banks. But one must uh, qualify that it, it will only help on, on, the, on the local level. It still won't solve the, the huge problems they have with their $17 trillion uh, national debt. Yeah, well, I mean, let's look after ourselves at home before we start yes. looking abroad. Now, uh, Stephen, then tell us if, if, it's, if, if, if you got um, into power and this People's Bank was to be established here in South Africa. Take us through a quick summary now. What would, what would happen? You'd create a bank and what would it do? How would it start solving much of these problems? What, 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 how would it work? Well, the first, the first thing you'd have to do is to retire the national debt because that's currently taking to about 20% of the annual budget uh, in the payment of interest. So we just have to swap Sorry, the... Sorry, just go back there uh, a second. <laughs> 20% of our national budget goes into paying our foreign debt. No, 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 it goes into paying interest. Interest, oh, excuse yes, me, yes. sorry, the yes. interest on yes. the debt. Yes. So that's even worse. That, that, that's <laughs> actually, it's ridiculous. It's just, yes. And, and, and at present, 36% uh, of our uh, government debt is held by foreigners, which is a very dangerous situation because um, they can dump that uh, debt any time you know, they feel so inclined and cause huge disruptions in our uh, foreign exchange and our, our, our uh, balance of trade. So uh, the first thing would be to uh, to repay that national debt with uh, the People's Bank. But how would it do that? Just tell us. Do you, would it? Where would it get? Where would this People's Bank get the money from? It would create the money out of nothing. Same, like the, the same way the banks are, are doing right now. Yes, and right. it would replace it. We'd, you'd have to do it over a sort of. Two to three year period, not and uh, you do it on a structured basis, five percent every two months, and then you you work it down and, until you've got it down to zero, uh, so as not to cause uh, too much disruption. And this 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 so called national debt will now be bearing zero interest. And what it means is that the the money supply, the money will it it will all balance out. So there's no net um, uh, increase. Um, or decrease. Now, once once you accomplish that, then the uh, one of the first things you need to do is to set up a state mortgage bank or people's mortgage bank, so that uh, people can then uh, cash in their uh, pay pay off their bonds and get zero interest bonds from the from the people's bank. So that will also have to be phased in, and that will mean that people who are currently spending about half their after-tax income on um, you know, capital repayments and interest will have that additional income uh, in which to liquidate their other debts and to uh, in increase their, their consumption of, of, of necessary and, and, and uh, 
test goods, which will then uh, you know, revitalize the economy. Wow. Uh, okay, so this the, is Stephen. Um, yeah, yeah, carry on, Michael. Stephen, can I just uh, 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 mm. throw a, a question in here? Um, obviously, the, the, the one of the problems we have here, at anyone who's a homeowner or a car owner that pays mm. Um, the, the monthly ridiculous amounts of interest on it. Uh, you know that you can take 20 years to 30 years to pay off your mortgage on your home or sometimes yes. even your car forever. And some, some people just never, ever pay it off. But mm. in essence, after the first seven or eight years or 10 years, you should have actually paid it all off. So um, could we not follow, um, and this is really what my contention is, in the footsteps, footsteps of Iceland where we actually any home loan or car loan that's older than X amount of years is automatically settled and closed because theoretically those people have paid off all the money that they borrowed, that they were so-called loaned and, um, and, and restructure the, the rest of the mortgages and all these loans to make it far more easy, uh, easy and accessible to the people to, for the people to deal with and not, not feel so strangled by it. Yes, we, we could, we could do that. Um, the first thing is, is to replace the, the loans that have been taken from the banks, uh, transfer them to the mortgage, to the, the people's mortgage bank, just to get the interest uh, factor uh, taken care of. Uh, and then one can look at, um, allowing pe people to, uh, receive a, um, what one could do, like they did in Germany in the thirties, you, uh, for every child in your family, you could, uh, reduce the loan, which is what they did by a quarter. So that if, if you've got uh, four children in your family, and this has been done before, then the, the loan is extinguished. Um, Fantastic. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean this, is, this is really – but this is just probably one of many different uh, advantages of having a people's bank yes. uh, because it can, it, can, it can deal with a lot of these problems um, instead of right now, which is it goes into a legal system. And uh, we've seen firsthand what our legal system does. I mean, it's, it's really just an extension of the banking system right now. Yes. And we're not yes. just saying this because we're, we're crazy. We've seen it ourselves physically and, mm. and, and experienced mm. it. Um, but instead, there's an alternative, and this gives the power back to the people, or certainly a larger degree of power back to the people. But now, who runs this bank, Stephen? Does, is it the government that runs this bank? Could it be turned into a, a, a you know, last year, the Auditor General said that the um, South African government squandered 32 billion rand in one year of unnecessary expenses. Now, if you gave them the power to be able to print their own money, isn't that just inviting chaos? How do you, how would you deal with that? I mean, who actually has the power to to create this money out of nothing and 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 serve the people, and how is it limited? Well, it's the the, the ultimate power would will, will um, result in parliament, and and uh, the proposal would include the the establishment of a monetary trusteeship, and this would consist of about eleven people who are uh, skilled in in economics and finance. Uh, do not have any connections with any uh, private corporations, and they would deliberate once a month on the increase in the uh, money supply to cater for uh, growth in population, in, in productivity, and in, ex in the expansion of the economy, uh, or decrease it if, if, if it is a requirement. Normally, if you decrease, you would use uh, temporary taxation. That's, that's a far more efficient way of doing it. So the monetary trusteeship would... Um, uh, determine the increases, and then the treasury would ad administer it. And the um, we would actually no longer really need to have. A, see that the People's Bank would then uh, have slightly different functions, and that would be actually continuing some of the existing functions of the Reserve Bank, and that is to have uh, banking supervision, uh, to regulate the banks, to issue them with licenses, and to see that they are abide by all the, the different rules. Okay, so you could then create a, a regional banks as a subset of the of the People's Bank, um, which is what the Reserve Bank is kind of supposedly doing now. But of course, it, 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 those licenses are reserved for only you know massive commercial structures. Uh, yes. How would that change? I mean, I'm, again, I'm looking for to the man on the street here. Would I be able to go to my local corner guy and be able to instead of getting absolutely slaughtered on interest and payday loans and this this micro lending, which is just just awful beyond belief. Um, yes. That there's going to be an alternative for them to go. Well, your your biggest investment in your life is, is, is your house, and and that will be done on an interest free basis. And we can even extend that to, to motor cars. The um, 
The private banks will be on a full reserve basis. In other words, they will take in deposits and then the, and they will offer a, an interest rate and then they will lend on those deposits to uh, borrowers. With the difference that they will have to share the risk. Instead of just looking at a borrower who's got certain assets and if he, if he, goes, uh, if he goes into default, they don't care. They know they're going to get the assets. They actually have to be very careful now about how they lend because they're lending other people's money. And in that way, uh, we will have less reckless lending and, and, and more res res responsible mm. lending. Now, just for those listening to this again as well, I mean, what Stephen mm. said there, they'll have to lend their own money and mm. instead of right now, which is, is, is they're, they're, <laughs> they're lending, or well, they're lending real money, I should say, instead of creating mm. this, this, this money mm. out of nothing, which is, is so important. I mean, this is what we need to get rid of. I mean, these banks are just producing mm. cash. I mean, I think the Americans for, for I don't know how long now have been <laughs> engaged in this quantitative easing where they're just pushing money into, into the system. Um, but yeah, Stephen, this is, this is fascinating. I mean, we can talk about this into, in a lot of detail, which I don't want to go into too much detail now, just really yes. for the people. Um, just tell me one question. Would this people's bank still work in the South African rand or would there be an, a new kind of currency called the Ubuntu dollar or the Ubuntu credit or something uh, that would compete with the rand? No, no. The, the intention would be to replace the rand so that the, the money in circulation currently is all private debt money bearing interest. We want to change it to interest-free state-owned money. In other words, the money that is in existence at the moment does not belong to you. Even if you've got a savings account, that money belongs to the bank. Um, if you look at it this way, if everyone should uh, repay all their loans, then the money supply would shrink to nothing. Because whenever you repay a loan, you reduce the money supply. Mm. But there would still be an interest portion still left to pay on that. That's the scary bit. Uh, no, the only people who would be paying interest would be those people who uh, borrow to set up an, uh, a company or, an, an, uh, or a business. Because then they would be borrowing money which has been, uh, produ which has been created by the state. Therefore, uh, you're entitled to ask some return because that is not, that is not uh, private bank money. Okay. I see. So I we'd, see. Have, we'd have, it, we'd have a, the system would be that the, the money in circulation would, be, would have been created by, the, by, the, by the, the people's bank. In other words, it's people's money. Right. Okay. So it's it's right, and it's 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 backed by the people. It's interest free, which is still, I think, the number one and most That's important right. aspect. Is, in, is in, in other words, of what we are planning to do, we're going to nationalise the money supply, but we're not going to nationalise the the banks. The commercial commercial banks can continue to uh, act act as lenders for for investment purposes. In other words, they become investment banks. Um, and we also must remember that half, currently half the income of commercial bank, private banks, come from outside activities, from from leasing, from from uh, foreign exchange transactions, from commissions. So this is not going to affect them to the extent that they're suddenly going to go out of business. In fact, they will probably make bigger profits because of the because of the economy booming. So they have nothing to fear. Okay. That, well, that's a good point. I appreciate that. I'm guessing um, interest. Uh, sorry, inflation. Would be pretty much wiped out because now you don't have interest on these loans, on this debt. Yes, well, the, the cause of inflation, and it, it's so simple, but they make it very complicated when you uh, read it in these uh, economic textbooks, is the interest which is created on loans created out of nothing. So that interest, in order to, to they only create sufficient money to for, for the loan. And then the interest has to be added at the end of the year. So they have to create another loan. And that is a non-productive loan because that it's only for the purposes of, of paying the interest. So without having to pay the interest on, um, on state-created money, there will then be zero inflation. And that is the – I mean, that if you look back, for example, to give you uh, an example which lasted from 1861 to 1914, the, uh, the State Bank of the Russian Empire, they had zero inflation throughout that period. Because the state was creating all the money. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, again, I'm I'm happy to hear that this has now been. You know, this is again. This is one of the primary reasons why I wanted to do this interview to you know to show people listening to this that there's a structure behind uh, uh, the Ubuntu um, you know utopian philosophy. And, and Michael, I agree. I think I'm going to stop using the word utopian now. Um, you've convinced me, and it's now hopefully gone out of my vocabulary. But I want to hear from I want to hear from the woman now. I want I want I want Louise. Louise you just heard a, a rational kind of 
you know, sort of, yeah, inflation, this, and interest here, and money out of nothing, and people's bank. I'd like to hear your interpretation of, 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 of Ubuntu. And, uh, I, you know, why did you get involved? And what's your, what's your whole, your feeling? I mean, you, 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 as it stands right now, you are poised to possibly become, uh, what, you, what would you call, a, uh, get, a, get a seat in Parliament. Just tell me, what's your whole approach to this? What's your attitude? Well, Scott, Scotty, um, I have a different take, I think. I'm not very clued up on banking. I think uh, we have three very capable men here that can handle all that. I, I, my sense of Ubuntu and my interest comes more to, um, into that place of um, where were we before the settlers arrived? There were people living here in Africa that were totally fine, living in, in abundance, in harmony with nature. You know, we, we complicate life. We've, we, we've brought upon ourselves this situation, and it was never necessary before. You know, it's, it's, it's a, an enforced slavery that comes from this um, Western civilization and the banking thing. My interest lies more in community and what happened, how people lived, how, how they interacted, what their lifestyles were like before we had to worry about earning a living. Because there were people here in Africa that were just being, they were just living beautiful lives. Now, interesting you say that, Louise, because, um, you know, up until a few years ago, before I started, you know, really researching community, what you're talking about now and sustainable and eco communities, and also, you know, being blessed to work with some extremely knowledgeable and researched people um, and well-traveled people in the space, is that there's a stigma to what you just said. I mean, there's a stigma to the, the ancient Africans, the old African, African tribal people, the Bushmen, etc. And that stigma is they were consistently fighting for food, consistently looking for water. It's as if they're trudging through the desert and they're hot and they're tired and they're don't seem to sleep and they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. But actually, if you look and you speak to people who have researched this before, and I'd like to hear your opinion on, on this, is that wasn't the case at all. Bushmen and, 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 all, and tribal people used to work a couple of hours a day at most. The rest was storytelling. It was adventuring. It was working with children. It was teaching. It was studying the stars. It was philosophizing. Tell me about your opinion on that. And how does this relate to the Ubuntu philosophy? Well, I'm suspicious. I mean, whose story was that, that we were living and fighting and, and suffering before the white man arrived? Whose story is that? You know, um, as you were saying, people have lived in communities forever and never needed a currency to, to survive. People, it's, it's our innate goodwill and, and our connection with the earth that makes it so easy to get along and make beautiful lives together for ourselves and, and to, spend, to be able to spend time philosophizing and, and learning about astrology, being connected to the, to the cycles of nature, because all of those things feed our, who we are. They feed our, our um, ability to, to be able to exist here. And I think, you know, very often we forget that we're living on a planet, a natural planet that sustains us. And money doesn't sustain us. This planet sustains us. And my Beautiful focus I love that always comment. tries to bring us back to, to remembering that we need to go back to that, to that way of being. And I believe it's not that far-fetched. It's innate. It's within all of us to be able to live and be in a beautiful surrounding with one another, free from all necessity to work, you know, and just do what we love and be who we are, because that's who we are, that as human beings, that's our reason for being. So who's going to uh, shovel the crap then? And uh, what about the people that won 50 Ferraris? I know, I was, Michael and I have an <laughs> ongoing debate. But you know, my answer and, and you know, we always looking to government to solve the problems or whatever, what is, what is the plan? But we never consider the fact that with freedom comes responsibility. And, you know, if we want to liberate ourselves, let's liberate ourselves. Let's turn our focus away from the slavery and let's make a plan. Let's all get together and, 
and put our energy and our time and our resources into creative, creating beautiful lives for ourselves. We have to take responsibility. We can't expect anybody to do this for us. Each and every single person needs to take responsibility for themselves and their greater community. And that's the only way Ubuntu is going to work. Ubuntu needs people working together with a similar philosophy or the same philosophy to bring about change. And that's really to add to what Louise is saying. That's why we call ourselves the Ubuntu Party, to bring, bring back those values of united communities working together for the, the abundance of everyone in the community, um, for the benefit of everyone in the community, at, at, and not at the expense of anyone in the community. And, um, and, and this is why it is so important to realize the bigger vision, the, the banking system and the current financial system, which is really the enslavement tool of humanity, is the one hurdle that we need to overcome because it is so deeply entrenched and so deeply uh, it, it is it is uh, interfered with every crack and crevice of our of our beingness as living breathing human beings that it's going to be quite a, a a journey an interesting journey to free ourselves from this um, enslavement and entrapment by money but as Stephen said. All these things have happened in the past. We've got great historical examples that are very simple solutions to adopt and get over that first very big bump, if you want to call it, to you know get away from the private global banks and the banking families control the global money supply, creating a bank that uh, a people's bank that creates money for the people by the people, and ultimately it's about the people. Everything the Ubuntu party stands for is about the people. People first, everything else comes second. Because people do everything, money does nothing. Um, it just gets in the way of people doing everything. So the people's, the job of the people bank, people's bank, is to make sure that the money is available and uh, for everything that the people want to do and achieve. And the moment that that happens, um, there'll, there's going to be a very interesting process of realization as this, as this, this incredible freedom and, utop and the um, embracing yes, yes. of this utopian <laughs> philosophy uh, comes about. There'll be a, an interesting shift, people realizing that since money is available for everything we need, slowly but surely we're going to start using less and less money. And very soon, people are going to say, well, what do we actually need the money for? If we're going to build the bridge, let's just build the bridge. Why do we need to go and get the money? Why don't we just build the bridge? Yeah, it does, it does uh, have a beautiful simplicity to it. Luis, tell me, um, how are you living now? I mean, what, you know, again, uh, anybody can write about this. Anyone can talk about it. But what are you physically doing on a day-to-day on -day basis that, make, that makes this real? Well, I... Spend all my time at the Stone Circle Ubuntu Village, which is our little place where we hope to implement the philosophy of of contributionism. And um, what we'd like to do there is to bring people that share the philosophy and invite them to come and and contribute their skills, their gifts, what they want to do for the greater good of of our little community here, and start start proving to ourselves and to others that we really don't need a currency to survive or to exist. You know, we, we have everything available to us in, in, in terms of what we can offer each other Let's and then ourselves. So, so I, I agree. And it's, um, it's decentralized communities, beautiful concept. And I know it's a strong part of the, of the Ubuntu philosophy and it's really, it's really powerful. Now, how are you dealing with the food issue? Because the three issues I wanted to talk about today was obviously the banking system, which we've talked about. And Stephen, again, excellent, um, you know, you know, in-depth sort of analysis on that. I'm sure you could talk for hours and there's huge amounts of structure on that. And, and we'll, it'll be mentioned again um, in this interview. But let's talk about the second one, which is now the food aspect and, and, and how are we looking at feeding the people? Because when I walk down Johannesburg streets and suburban streets and in all the different cities, I don't see a huge amount of food growing which I don't understand, because if we were to replace a lot of this with food, there would be a huge... I mean, why are we not growing our own food? What's, what's, what's your Ubuntu party's philosophy with regard to food, and how are you practically going to implement this, this notion of feeding the people? 
forgive my simplicity once again, but nobody's growing food because they have to go to jobs to earn money to buy food. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We didn't have to do that. And people all grew something in their gardens. We all have that ability to do, to, to grow something. There'd be such an abundance of food, medicine, whatever we need. If we, we spent a couple of hours a day just focusing on feeding ourselves, you know, taking that responsibility and planting seeds in the ground, it's so ridiculously easy to do. You know, we've been brainwashed into thinking that growing food is a specialized science. It's not. Everybody can do that, and we, everybody should be doing that. It's really that simple. That's a very good point. We don't make have it. to feed the people. The people can feed themselves. We can decentralize food production to each community, and depending on what each community can grow, we can always um, exchange various types of food, depending on, on climate or whatever, but... We, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing with our time? If we grew food, we wouldn't have to feed the people. We'd well, I'm feeding ourselves. I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. And it, it is something that's happening um, around the world as more and more food gardens start to be set up um, and the decentralization it's of food begins to happen, um, which is just, uh, it's just, it's something that is, for me is a no brainer, like you said. And you said something very beautiful. You talked about food becoming this complicated science. I mean, agricultural degrees are exactly. take years to study. What? How to use a combine harvester most effectively? What kind of uh, pesticides to use in certain mm -hmm. climate conditions? What kind of genetically modified organisms will work well? And I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Why aren't we just planting? And um, and I'd like to to ask Sid this now. Sid, Sid's been a bit quiet. Uh, uh, he hasn't had really had much chance to speak. So I'd like to give him that chance now. Now I've seen Sid. I've seen you build food forests and food gardens, and you've, you've had a lot of experience in permaculture. Tell me practically: is this decentralization of food gardens? A myth, a crazy idea, or can it happen? And if so, how w would it happen? And how long would it take to happen if the Ubuntu party was given the chance to make it happen? No, well, firstly, yes, Scotty, it can happen. But I think we also need to understand that currently we have millions or billions of people in cities. And what has been created is the illusion and the lie that the world is overpopulated. What these corporations effectively have done is they've driven people into cities um, living, living in little tin shacks and they have given that, they've created that illusion that there are too many people in the world. But when you go and do, math, when you go and do the maps and you work out that uh, we've got 7.2 billion people in the world today, if you had to give every man, woman and child um, two soccer fields on which to live, it would take up less than 10% of the world's land mass. Not only that, the current agricultural land or, la or, the, or the land that can yield agriculture currently on earth is about 30%. So there's more than enough land for that. And if you have smaller communities growing food, they can grow food for people in the cities. Growing food is not, that, uh, is not, is not rocket science. Well, we've seen this in Russia with the Dutchniks, um, and uh, you know, some people here, here people go to Plet or, or to various, you know, nice little holiday places on the on the south coast or wherever they go. Uh, but in Russia, a lot of people go to their little outside city little farms called Dutchniks, where they actually produce their own food. Do you see something like that happening, Sid? Um, I mean, and again, I want to go back to the practicalities. I mean, is it possible for a family? Or a small community to learn how to grow their food quickly and to start growing and become food sufficient quickly. Is it physically possible? Oh yes, it is physically possible. You could do that within uh, within the space of two months, provided they should, they are given the land. Remember, a lot of corp a lot of the land falls under corporate control nowadays, corporate and government. Even in South Africa, about forty five percent of the land is controlled by corporations and government. Um, not by not by private individuals, and a lot of that land is more than more than um, we have enough land just under government hands at the moment to give people to grow food and in your little Ubuntu villages and so on as well you know one third of the food will go to the village and the other two thirds can be uh, produced for bigger cities not everybody wants to live in a small village people like food. some people like the cities and uh, 
they can then trade for other um, services around them. Yeah. Do they? Do you, would you? The, the type of techniques that they would have to learn would this involve? Uh, fertilizers. I mean, to what degree do you believe that this is completely organic and natural versus, um, you know, more kind of monoculture focusing? I mean, how, how do you see no, that happening? Well, is again, it a combination? No, we, or don't, is it a... we don't. No, we can't. We, we shouldn't go into monoculture. Monoculture is destroying the, the topsoil on the of the land. But monoculture the today, yeah. growing the same thing over growing and over the again. Same same thing over and over again, or growing huge tracts of land with one particular crop. You want to actually mix your crops, and you want to use organic farming methods. It has also been shown that by using things like biodynamic uh, farming as well as mixed crops and crop rotation, you can restore the topsoil of the land in a particular area within a, within a, within a period of eight years. You can fully restore the topsoil. Um, we've even tried that out in uh, places like KwaZulu-Natal where we have used uh, biodynamic farming methods. And our first yield, we had a 10% yield. The second, the second time round, we had about an 80% yield. Bumper harvest, yeah. That's yeah. right. So, yeah, we've actually tested that and proven that it can work. And again, one only just has to go on the internet and, and look at, uh, yeah. at what's happening around the world to see uh, food forests, organic food gardens, um, fish. I mean, Michael, you like to talk quite a bit about uh, fish and, and, and the water, and, and this will slowly start leading us on the energy side of it. But, uh, Michael, tell us about your ideas with regards to a village from a food perspective and how you would see an Ubuntu village um, uh, growing and starting off. Well, uh, Scotty, it, it, it all comes down to really understanding the absolute control in all the different industries that humanity faces. Um, starting at the energy, the electricity supply, the petroleum control of the giant corporations around the world that, that ensure and go to extreme lengths to make sure that alternative energy sources uh, do not uh, reach the people. Um, and um, it goes to the control of the pharmaceutical industries, it goes to control, uh, you know, uh, and so forth. So it's the control of the people that, that once you realize that, it, you realize how, how easy it is to create abundance in a community. Um, and therefore, once people have access to cheap or virtually free electricity and the supply of energy, um, everything changes. And this is why the, the provision of free or virtually free electricity within the Ubuntu model is paramount to the foundation of creating Ubuntu and contributionist communities. And Sid mentioned the word um, earlier is that, you know, in Ubuntu villages and Ubuntu communities, the whole philosophy is, is to create an abundance, not just create self-sustaining communities. And this is the big difference between Ubuntu and contributionist communities and self-sustained communities. Self-sustaining communities worry about sustaining themselves. Ubuntu communities worry about sustaining themselves and producing three times as much as what they need in every area of their, of their needs in that community. So they'll create, in our community, we'll create three times as much fish as we need in the fish farm that's not currently standing empty and deserted. Um, we'll create three times as much butter and bread and milk and, and vegetables and, and whatever it is, building materials. And why can we do that? We can do that because we are providing the people of the community with a cheap or a virtually free source of electricity. Once that flow of electricity is going, and uh, you then use that as leverage for the people to say, right, everybody is going to get free or virtually free electricity. But in return for that, get, receiving that electricity, you have to contribute three hours or five or six hours, whatever it is, a week, but it's a small amount. Three, let's stick with three hours. Three hours a week towards one of the community projects of your choice, whether it's working in the bakery or planting seedlings or breeding fish or making butter, uh, or if you're a chemical engineer working in the sewage, trying to figure out different ways of dealing with sewage disposal. And the interesting thing is that if you've got a community of a thousand people, uh, suddenly you have 3,000 hours a week of people contributing their skills towards uh, these various diverse community projects. 
Now, you can see very quickly, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out very quickly that every week, 3,000 hours a week is a lot of hours that people are going to be doing things and creating things for their own community in return for getting free electricity. Now, at that moment, I think everyone will realize that we change the concept of scarcity and economy, economizing into the philosophy of abundance, creating abundance on the scale that we currently in our capitalistic um, restraining restraints cannot imagine. Michael, um, I wonder, you've, you've hit the nail on the head here uh, for me and you, you, because the, the first thing people think about is, is how do we feed the people, how do we feed the people. Right now, every other election candidate uh, is talking about how do we create jobs, how do we create jobs, how do we create jobs. I mean, it's just like, I don't know who decided that jobs were the number one flavor of this particular election, but that's what it is. Um, and jobs have not been mentioned once. In fact, we're trying to get people away from the jobs. If any, you're almost like the antithesis right now of 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 all the yes. other parties. Remember, Scotty, and thanks for bringing it up. Jobs are the enemies of people. Jobs is a construct of corporations. Jo a job is an enslavement. It's a prison sentence. Okay. Remember that a job is just there for as long as the corporation or the person that employs you or creates the job has a need for you. The moment they have no longer a need for you, they get let you go, they kick you out, and you're on the street. Again, jobless, homeless, and hungry. And this is why it doesn't work. It has to be a complete restructuring of the entire socioeconomic structure. Instead of looking for jobs, we should be looking at how do we work it together as a community for a few hours a week, everybody in the community towards one of the many diverse community projects. What it also does, incidentally, and I'm sure you've already figured this out, that if you go and work for three hours in you know, breeding fish and then you get tired of it after a month or six months because you're only doing it for three weeks, uh, th three hours a week, and then you decide you want to go learn how to bake bread and work in the bakery to bake bread uh, as your community project contribution. So you're also learning life skills. So it's not just actually participating in community projects. It's actually for yourself. It's empowering yourself and learning life skills. So after two or three years of doing these various community projects, my goodness, everybody will be so well skilled. Everybody will have be the abilities that they never imagined they could have before. Michael, and this is sounding though, I mean, if this was the 1970s, you would be, people would look at you and go, you, you, what, you're a commie bastard. Uh, you know, is this, you know, they, 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 would, they would be saying to you things like, um, isn't this just communism? Now, tell, tell us about how this differentiates from, from communism, and um, I'd also like to hear from all four of you on this particular matter. I mean, you've got th – this kind of idea has been bandied around before. What is so unique about Ubuntu now that makes us different? Well, first of all, communism is, is, uh, is, has never really been implemented. You know, we, I don't want to get too caught up in talking about communism because the, the communism in its purest form – the way it was presented and it's at its beginning was never actually implemented. It was hijacked and distorted. And I'm sure Stephen will have a, a lot more information about how, how the, the, the Bolshevik revolution was funded by the bankers, which, which I've also write about in my book. Uh, and so you realize that the, the whole, the, the, the pure <laughs> philosophy of people working together towards the greater benefit of all the people uh, was hijacked and turned into uh, Leninism and Stalinism and Bolshevism and, and all these other, um, other things that, that came out of it, which was really just a dictatorship, which was just using money. They were still using money. So what, what Ubuntu and contributionism say is that we can start using money for the benefit of the people to move ourselves away from the use of money eventually completely because we actually don't need money. We need people because people do everything. Money does nothing. And right now they're being hijacked by the corporations in this concept called the job, which as Louise eloquently pointed out, um, is yes. taking people away from what they should be doing, which is growing food and telling stories and spending time with their children and families and communities. So, so just to add to this job thing, remember that, and that, that is again a construct of our schooling system and our education system, which is also a construct of the bankers, which is really the Carnegie's, the, the Rockefellers and the Carnegie's were very involved in setting up the current education system that we have, the banking families, because they realize that they're going to have to create, have to create a dumbed down labor force in future with certificates look, going out looking for jobs. So the entire education system that we had is funded the research institutions, the 
the, ba- the, the universities, all these are funded by banking families. Well, you just and- have to look at that. Uh, if you go to almost any university these days, the uh, various experts branches, what would you call them? Divisions? Uh, not divisions, but the, the... The faculties. Faculties, thank you. That's what The faculties of these research institutions are nearly always sponsored by the high-powered uh, uh, corporations. So if you're a medical, if you do a medical degree, they'll just so happen to be a Pfizer research laboratory, which is funding a whole bunch of research. And they'll be next door, will just be happen to be, you know, engineering firms for the engineering. I, 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 do, I do understand that. Um, but I want to go back to this and get and get um, Stephen's input and everybody else's as well. Stephen, is there an element of communism in the Ubuntu philosophy? And to what extent is this what extent is it um, comparable? No, I don't think there's, there's any uh, remote connection with communism. Uh, communism is a brutal system enforced by the bankers in order to exploit uh, initially Russia and then uh, China and the other East European countries. Uh, it, it, it's not a uh, it's not a, a natural system, and uh, it can only be maintained by force. So uh, that, that's why it, it never succeeded. Well, that's a very good point. Now you mentioned yeah. you, you hit something else on the. Uh, this is this mm. notion that it has to be enforced. Yes. It has to be a military force that that holds people together somehow. That you know that that this that this element and and and, and that's what you say. So how how is this now going to, uh, you know, not to take you off the the qu- answering the question because I do want to mm. know how how it differentiates and and this, especially with regards to the to the use of money, um, and your new system is still going to to use money. But how is this? What, what would happen to the military and what would happen to these aspects about it of, of, um, of our day-to-day lives at the moment? I'm guessing you're not going to abolish the military and the police force overnight. Well, <laughs> obviously you need the, the police to maintain internal order, uh, but eventually you will hope that it will be at a much reduced level. I mean, a defence force doesn't exist to, uh, compared to what was before, so I mean, there's not much to do in that direction. Uh, there's one other thing I, I, I would like to uh, stress why Ubuntu, in fact, offers the only solution, because the current paradigm is not working. And, in fact, it will never work. Uh, in, in one of the papers I wrote, I, I mentioned the uh, the Gini coefficient. Uh, Corrado Gini was a statistician who, uh, over 100 years ago, um, uh, worked out this coefficient for calculating the distribution of income in different countries. And I just want to share the, the, the current figures in South Africa. 10% of the population uh, earn 50% of the national income, 40% earn 7%, and 20% earn 1.5%. Wow. We have the worst ratio in the world. What? In uh, And this is quite ironic. During the high point of apartheid in 1970, the, the, the Gini coefficient was 0.49. The, it's, the way that the uh, coefficient is calculated, if it is one, then one person controls everything. Uh, so the lowest is currently 0.24, uh, and that is – there's many countries like Denmark and uh, other Scandinavian countries. And then it rises up. The average is 45. And as I say, we were 49 in 1970. We are now on 0.70. We have the worst uh, – um, uh, coefficient in the world. And that proves that the existing system cannot work and it has absolutely no future. Uh, therefore, we have to take no, on, on, we have to adopt alternatives. There's not, there's not even a discussion point because uh, the maldistribution of, of wealth and income in this country is so great, uh, eventually there is going to be some consequence. It, it may be a revolution, I don't know, but uh, there has to be a change. And unfortunately, none of the other parties are addressing this problem. Sid, what's your take? You've been following the political, the existing political campaign quite a lot, and I've heard you listening to radio interviews and all sorts of things and following this discussion closely. What's your opinion of the current um, agendas with regards to, with regards to the existing, the ANC and the DA and the, and the bigger parties um, versus what Ubuntu is offering? Is it, is, it, is it as different as what it seemed to be, as Ubuntu is really coming at, at, at hugely from left field? Or is there a change within the existing party structure? Well, Scott, no, look, every other political organization in this country is following the, just a small variance on the same on the same model as the ANC and the DA. 
Um, I think the reason why I got involved with the Bund Party is because people don't actually look around them and see what's going on in the world today. Um, for instance, the United Nations was set up in 1945 in order to prevent wars. Yet, 194 wars have been fought, and yeah. we're not even talking about the other 3,000 skirmishes yeah. um, mm. since that time up to 2007. Uh, we, we have a look at um, the, a third of the world's food just gets thrown away, yet there are a billion people starving, either starving or they are undernourished also known as malnutrition, so they are still dying of something. Uh, we, can, we, we, look at, we look at the situation in our country, we, we, we drive past these townships where people are living in squatter camps. We come across more and more people dying of disease, cancers and other things, and money doesn't even influence that anymore. Whether the people are rich or poor, so the quality of our food has been degraded. They are feeding, as of about four years ago, our agricultural union introduced 232 chemical fertilizer as a feed for cattle in winter so that they would actually graze long grass Goodness. because it stimulates the enzymes in the stomach and, and, and allows them to eat that. So the, the food that we are eating is poisoning us. Um, organizations like the United Nations have never stopped a war. In fact, they've just, the partner countries to the United Nations have been involved in all of these wars. We've got 8, bil 8 million children a year in the world that go missing. And they, these situations aren't even investigated anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, if you so, look at it in this country, you, you, we have a national credit regulator who's supposed to regulate credit, yeah. but we're in the worst situation with people so debt slaved right now, they can't even feed themselves. And people believe in democracy. I mean, can they not see what's going on around them in the world? So, so you does, know, what I'd like to do here is, while Sid is talking about the, you know, the dark stuff, just want to bring it back onto the light side, because I, I'd really, <laughs> I, I think it's important that the Ubuntu party spreads the good news and brings the, the, the positive news to the people and remind people that the, that the country belongs to its people. It does not belong to the government. And once again, people forget that. People forget that we elect our government to be our servants. And if the servants are not serving us, then we should do something about it. We need to replace them and put different people in there that are doing for the people, for us, what we want as the people. It's a very simple system, isn't it? So... Yeah. We need to re-establish this balance and the status quo. Louise, you're when, here on the ground. I mean, you, you do, you, as you said, you're doing it. You've got your Ubuntu village. Um, uh, you know, understanding it's a simple concept. What, what is missing at the moment for you? What do you think, you, if you could have something, what would it be to just ignite the Ubuntu villages uh, and help your day-to-day -day life um, and give you that, that lifestyle you've, you've, you've talked about? Well, it's, it is uh, what, we, what we are promoting in our... Um, election campaign. Oh, is Louise there? I, wanted to, to, I wanted to ask Louise, to, is she there? Say that again, sorry? Uh, the question was directed to Louise. Sorry. Oh, um, Ubuntu needs people, quite simply. We, our philosophy will only work and take shape and grow and become real if, if we all carry the strand, which is a part, uh, a part of the whole. Each, each and every one of us carries a strand of the whole, and that's the philosophy of Ubuntu. Each and every single one of us has a valid role to play in community, and it's only until we recognize that we are divine fractals of the source, we are powerful beyond our imagination at this time, and that once we, once we come together and, and offer our skills and our time and our energy, that's when everything's going to take shape. For me, the most critical aspect of Ubuntu is people coming together. People, people will make it all happen, as Michael says over and over again. 
Yeah, well, as Michael does say, uh, you know, it's the people that, that do the things, people that build the bridges. Uh, Stephen, I think you're just breathing into your, your mic a little bit there. Um, Sorry. Your, uh, people, people build the bridges. Money doesn't. Corporations don't exist. They're pieces of paper at the end of the day. Uh, it's the people that do the work, uh, the people that, that, that build the roads and, and um, are, are the lovers and the, and the givers. And I, I agree with that. And, and I want to move on to the final aspect now. Um, and I want, I want to really, this, this is just for me, is, is really the Ubuntu's ace up its sleeve. And I realize it's, it's, it's just a concept that if you told me about it a year ago, I would have just said this is completely crazy until an experience I had at the end of last year. And I'll bring my own personal experience into this. And that was when um, I saw for the first time a, an actual, um, let's, I'm just going to call it, I know it's not really what it is, but I'm going to, for a better for want of a better term, I'm going to call it a free energy device. When I actually saw a device like that working, and I was there, I felt it, and I saw it, and it was quite a, a life-changing experience for me, because up until then, the amount of nonsense on the internet, the amount of empty promises with people promising to give free energy devices and free electricity to the people, and consistently, and, and everybody's got some weird device that happens to work, and none of the academics believe it, and no one say, everyone says it's a hoax. When I physically saw it in Cape Town, and the person, uh, and for those of you who want to go and have a look at it, just go and research the Ainsley circuit. This is where I, I came into it, into it with Rosemary Ainsley. And I physically saw that such a device is possible. It, it, was, a, it was a big shift for me. And I want to talk, talk you guys to talk me through this because you keep talking about free and cheap energy. How is this going to work? Because I know it's possible. But how far off is it really? And I know, Michael, you are with the energy breakthrough movements. You, you, you speak at these conferences. How close is this really? Um, it, we're very close, um, Scotty. The, there are thousands of scientists, inventors, and um, researchers that, are, that have developed free energy devices. We know that free electricity and alternative sources of energy is not only possible, but it has been developed before and given to the world. The most famous example, obviously, always being Nikola Tesla. And everything we use in the world of electricity today uh, and electronics, um, and uh, including television and radio, all that, is all Tesla technology based. And yet most people that go to, um, to, to university and study uh, electrical engineering hardly get taught anything about Nikola Tesla. It's quite spectacular. So it's, it's, you agree it's real. I mean, this is not a it, – it's, it's there. It's possible. It's, it's absolutely real. We know – I have seen uh, free energy devices myself. I have seen them um, uh, at these uh, energy conferences that I've been attending around the world. Um, the, the biggest problem, as I said earlier, the most fiercely protected area of global industry is the energy supply the, and the petroleum and the electricity supply energies. Now, you're they saying will, electricity supply is fundamental to Ubuntu contributionism working. It is, it is one of the founding um, uh, cornerstones, absolutely. It is almost, it is almost the, the breaker of the enslavement um, pattern. Because once you have an energy device or a f the supply of free electricity or free energy to a community, that community can do everything and anything for itself. It does not and, and cannot be controlled to a certain extent. Because remember, the way, the way that in, in, a, in a society that operates either on a supply of tax-free and interest-free money, so that money is available for everything, so everything can be done, or a society that's moved completely away from the need of money because they've, they've grown in consciousness enough to know that they don't actually need it to build the bridge, they just need to build the bridge. And, um, and once you've got that philosophy going and, and you've got these communities working together, everything changes because in a world where money doesn't exist or is not a hurdle to progress, um, we won't be driving cars the way we drive cars today. We're not going to be using petrol the way we use petrol today. We'll be, we'll be living in communities differently. Our houses will look different. We probably won't need roads because we'll have technology, levitation technology that exists and has existed in the past that we'll utilize for transportation. Everything changes. The, the scientists that work on uh, developing cures for diseases will have all the support they need to actually prevent diseases before a child is even born so that the DNA is actually um, treated before a child is born and does not, is not born with defective DNA that then causes disease throughout its life and so forth. All this technology has been achieved before and will be achieved again. Um, so 
you know, this is really a huge fundamental uh, shift, complete turnaround in the way we see these communities. So, as I mentioned earlier, once you have a community that's got free energy and the people um, then leverage um, the community's uh, contribution in exchange for this free electricity and everybody in, a com in the community um, contributes three hours a week towards one of the many community projects, the abundance that will come out of that community is spectacular. That's all, three, it's three hours a week. Is that your, your magic number? That's our magic number, and and you know, for the people that don't know why we use it, you know, we, we use we use these numbers that come out of sacred geometry. Everything in 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 human history and ancient civilizations, for those that have studied this, will know that all the ancient cultures use sacred geometry for everything they did, and this is what we do as well because it is a natural order of things. This is how everything in in the universe and in creation falls together. Through, through the simple principles of sacred geometry. And three is a very important number, like the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, for people that understand it, is actually a, a sacred geometric pattern as well that makes a lot more sense when you start studying it in great detail. And, um, and, and three hours a week, you know, just do the numbers. If you have a, a town like ours, Waterfall Boerfen, 4,000 or 5,000 people. If half of the people in Waterfall Boerfen, 2,500 people a week, work for three hours, you got 7,500 hours a week <laughs> of productivity. Can you imagine the amount of produce, goods, and services that will come out of that? Absolutely. Sid, tell us a little bit about um, your experiences with, uh, with, with what Michael's talking about with regards to the technologies and um, and the practicalities of, of a movement like this. You've done a lot of research in, in this field as well. No, look into the energy fields. I've worked with, uh, worked with free energy devices myself. Um, I've tested them. Um, I, the, only, the only thing that I haven't done is put uh, certain very expensive oscilloscopes and stuff to the test with them because of the the costing and uh, the availability what is that is that is the purpose of that to prove it to you? um well that's that's just to prove to electrical engineers that uh it's these real. devices are real and can work but i've actually i've actually put them to the test physically so i do know that they work yes and uh it's undeniable these things do exist i mean I sounded a little uh, negative just now, which wasn't my point. I'm I'm actually very optimistic about the future of the the human race. Um, the only thing that I do realize that a lot of our political opponents don't is that one has to understand what the root cause of a problem is in order to solve it. And having spoken to a number of politicians at the IEC and so on, these guys are just following the same band wagon without really understanding what the root cause was. Well, it's a formula, it's a methodology. The, exactly. The Ubuntu party understand what caused the problem in the first place, they've identified that and have therefore the answer to sorting it out. And the answer being, again, uh, am I, have I got it yeah. right guys? I mean, the, the three things that you, I know there's more, uh, there's, there's, there's a longer list, but the, the three primary ones are, are your food, your energy and your banking system. Um, is that correct? Is, Michael, is that, is that right? And yeah, I would, I would say that's pretty much there. I don't know what, or how Stephen feels about that, but it starts with the banking because that, that frees up the money for the people to then you know provide the, the alternative energy and electricity and that allows the people to then utilize that free electricity and energy to create abundance starting with food and you know water and housing and security and, and uh, health care and everything else. It follows. The, once you got that, it's, it becomes a chain reaction, a domino effect if you want to call it that. Excellent. Now, I want to go, just to finish off now, I want to go through just, just around Sorry, the... yeah, Scott. Scott yes, I Stephen, I was going to ask you, me? yes. Um, I, I'd just like to uh, re repeat a quotation from Henry Kissinger. Um, he said uh, well, some years ago, who controls the food supply controls the people, who controls the energy controls the nations. And I think that's what it all revolves around, and we need to break away from that. Sure, Thank yeah. you, Stephen. That, that's really important that you mm, brought that up. Yeah. And Very these well, statements by these by these nasty politicians of the past are just spectacular. When you find them today, mm. and you realize that they've really got the global 
community and the draconian enslavement of the, the people of the world to the to the point to this to this the, this cutting edge where we now have to stand up and say we are no longer be going to be bullied into this submission and control by these people. Yeah, very very well put. Um, and and agreed. Uh, it's really. I mean, anyone listening to this, I think, will start to really understand that there's more to it. And especially, you know, I want, I want you to finish off last, Michael. I want you to talk a little bit about your book because ultimately that's where they can get a lot a lot more detail on this. But just to finish off, uh, you know, we've talked about those three things. You know, I hope hoping that people listening to this will realize that the Ubuntu Party is really made up of of a group of people um, that are very different, but very well enlightened, very well researched and have a wealth of practical real experience uh, as opposed to you know this, this kind of system driven mentality where everything has to fit into the existing blueprint that's been already laid out for us and heaven forbid we change that blueprint because if we do we label nutcases and conspiracy theorists and that's got to end now and um, I love it when you know when we talk about that awkward moment when your friends suddenly start realizing that the conspiracy theorist that they've always dreaded is actually right. And that awkward moment is going to start being felt by a lot of people around South Africa and around the world when they realize basic, simple truths that they have grown up with are not quite as set in stone as we've always believed. So just to finish off, Stephen, is there anything you want to, to, to finalize, to, to want to add to this discussion for, for those listening? And this will be sent to 160,000 you know, New Era members. Uh, plus, of course, will be put all over social media, and we're hoping that people who are serious about Ubuntu and haven't yet been able to make up their mind will be able to get the full, well, not the full picture, but certainly go into to more detail as to what Ubuntu is about. So Stephen, did you want to add anything to, to finish off? Well, I just want to say that, that our, our, our present um, concentration on reforming the banking system is just a stepping stone. It, it's, not, uh, we're not, it's not the be all and end all of our program. And uh, only, only once we've achieved that can we open up all those new wonderful vistas which are awaiting us. Yeah, that's well very said. Yeah, well said, Stephen. That's exactly um, very important. It is a stepping stone, and you know, in an election campaign, you can't you can't write pages and pages of information and knowledge. You have to choose the key elements that that are uh, that affect the people most. And there is one undeniable thing. Uh, that affects the people of South Africa more negatively than anything else, and that is the banking, the financial dire straits that every South African finds themselves in, whether they're rich or poor, they're equally enslaved and controlled by the banking system. I agree, and I've always said, you know, ex uh, exploitation doesn't discriminate. This is yeah. not a racial thing at all. Every color, no matter, even rich people are discriminated against hugely when it comes to when it comes to money. Um, and and it does, exploitation does not discriminate. Everybody's being exploited, and you know we need to understand that. And 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 Scotty, it's it's also you know when when the rich people who who often don't look at the alternatives because they they got a lot of money, they run big corporations and they, they're very set in their ways, they're very confident and often quite arrogant, the ego is very high and then they hit a bump, they hit a bump in the road and something changes and suddenly they come upon this information that we're sharing here, that the banks control everything and that they completely at the mercy of the bankers and that they didn't really understand how the whole thing, thing worked and they, the entire corporation and all the thousands of people they employ is completely dependent on the mercy of these banking families and the bankers that control the world. And, uh, and suddenly they have a change and, and if, they, if the bump that they hit in the road, their corporate life is more severe than, than they were hoping for, then suddenly and they lose everything like we've, we've known many people with large companies that just suddenly lose everything because of banking practice, these people become angry when they realize how they've been taken for a ride by this global banking fraud, which you have called the largest organized crime syndicate in the world, because that's really all it is, um, pulling the wool over all our eyes, including the wealthy uh, owners of large corporations that suddenly realize this and these guys become even more angry than the poor people because the poor people's lives are affected on a daily basis and they just mm. you know they feel it every day these guys suddenly and 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 i think when these these sort of um captains of industry start um siding with with uh, the philosophy of ubuntu uh, and i believe it's going to start happening very quickly 
uh, it's it's uh, going to be a landslide like everything else and, and uh, exponential growth like everything else. Uh, we're going to see a rapid change in consciousness and how people approach the philosophy of Ubuntu and moving away from this mm. money-driven um, global system. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're going to see that more and more, and I'm looking forward to, to, to that. I mean, simple things that corporations can do. Let's not forget, guys, that the corporation is itself a construct that was created out of, uh, out of fraud and misrepresentation. And anyone who watches the documentary, The Corporation, will understand that what a corporation actually is. What is it? What is these legal entities? You know, we see smiling Vodacom bunnies and all these kind of weird cartoon characters, and we get these personalities that, that come to make these corporations look all high and mighty or, or, or cute or whatever they want us to believe. But ultimately, they don't exist. They are figments of our imaginations. They are legal fiction that we give them the power. And they are not more powerful than us unless we choose to give that. And we've got to take that power back. Um, and uh, and, and that's, it's great that we can have this discussion. There's not too many political parties out there that we could have this kind of interview with. And that's what makes Ubuntu extremely special. Um, and, uh, and I still want to just close off with everybody else. Um, Louise, what, what is your closing statement? I just want to say that... It's been so overwhelming being a part of this journey. You know, we've got members in more than 193 countries around the world, which just goes to prove to me that regardless of whether you understand what the word Ubuntu means, everybody, everywhere resonates this truth. And people are waking up to the fact that we really, ourselves, have the answers to the problems here. We don't have to look at at anybody to solve problems for us for us, but we can we can we can do it for ourselves if we come together in open heartedness and in truth, you know. We can we can do anything. And I'm just really excited. I'm just really excited in expanding this vision on a political platform, but also um, across the globe because the Ubuntu is expanding everywhere. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Well put, Louise. Um, thank you, because that's, that's ultimately what's needed. And it does seem like, you know, this, is, this kind of movement is the first time that something's really been, that all these sort of fragments of goodness are, are crystallizing, you know, into something tangible that, that's, and workable that, that's going to be put into, into use. Um, and yeah, well said. Thank you. And, and thank, thanks again to you, Stephen. Uh, Sid, closing remarks? No, Scotty, I think it's just a matter of as people become aware about what is really going on, you often meet people and after a chat you see the light come on. And that's really what the Ubuntu Party is trying to achieve now, is just to get a, get a voice in Parliament at national level so that people can uh, hear for the first time. Because most media... It's got, uh, well, the media is controlled by these corporations and they don't want to let people hear what we have to say. Michael, just to finish off, um, before you, you get you go into the sort of website details and, 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 and letting people know where you can get your book, just tell us, you know, one thing about political parties, people listening to this are going to go, oh, I wish this could just get out there to more people. The Ubuntu Party is showing that, that I really believe them, you know, I might even vote for them, but, you know... They're only going to get a few hundred votes because no one's going to know about them. I want you to tell us why this campaign is different and just let people know that there's radio and TV and what are you guys doing to really get this message out there? Well, we, we're, we're blessed with, uh, as Louise mentioned, we got members in more than 198 countries, I think it is as of today. Um, and through a crowdfunding campaign, we were able to actually participate in these elections. So as you so eloquently put it earlier a few weeks ago, Scotty, we're the first political party, I think, in the world probably, to come into existence and participate in a national election because of crowdfunding. So that says a lot about people's confidence in our philosophy, what we stand for, and, and where the global sentiment, sentiment is moving. And uh, so we've spent, we've, we've managed to raise well over 600,000 rand for this for this election wow. which has been put into paying the deposits paying for street uh, street poll um uh, posters that go, that have gone up um uh, i think we printed about four and a half thousand which is nothing compared to the big parties but it gives us a presence and people have been commenting they've seen our posters we got radio advertising in six languages um that we've managed to put together which uh, again that's just 
uh, you know, a, an expense and a cost that most uh, small parties cannot afford. And we wouldn't be able to afford it either if we didn't get the, the crowdfunding mm-hmm. campaign going. But that's great. We, I mean, the, the radio, street polls, flyers, T-shirts. I mean, this is, this and, is stuff you're doing. This is great that you're onto that. And let's, of course, remember the mobile, the mobile campaign. The mobile campaign as well, and also television. You know, we, we're on, on, on all three SABC channels. We're also on Soweto TV. Um, we got 43 commercials on Soweto TV. That's huge exposure on a television that is as influential in one of the biggest um, cities in South Africa, Soweto. You know, and, um, and, and the surrounding areas, obviously. And then our, and our um, cell phone campaign, which has been extraordinary. I mean, we've, we've got close to half a million um, subscribers now that have opted to get more information about the Ubuntu party in a month. Um, and that's incredible. That's, that's extraordinary, yeah. So, so at this stage, it looks like we've got way over half a million um, supporters and people that are interested in the Ubuntu party. And it's just about how this word is going to spread and how these people are going to vote when they actually face the ballot. Hopefully all half a million will, will vote in favor of Ubuntu. Wow, that's great. And I think to all those people listening to this, the ultimate way that this is going to be spread is by you. If you're listening to this, you are the one that needs to tell people, forward it on to your to people, forward it to your friends, tell them about it, colleagues. You know, don't be scared to share it. Don't be don't be scared to, to talk about this. It's time these kind of issues got discussed. Uh, we're sitting with a you know a situation where you know we, we are we are and a lot of people are hurting in dire straits. We've got textbooks that are being dumped. They're not even getting to schools. It's ludicrous. We we're, we're living in a completely topsy turvy upside down world. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know this this political party really is 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 trying to well, in the process of turning things over. So Michael, just to finish off, uh, where just tell us about your book. Where can they find your book? Uh, websites. What do people need to know to continue their research about Ubuntu and share it? Well, first of all, just for very quick references, go to our website. There, there is a wealth of information on the news uh, on the news page, the landing page on our website. That's ubuntuparty.org.za, ubuntuparty.org.za, and just scroll down on the news page, and you'll find a lot of hundreds of articles, um, our posters, our TV ads, our radio ads. Uh, everything is there. Our press releases. Uh, and then look around as well at some of the other philosophies on 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 our on our uh, website. Um, you know the opening statement of why Ubuntu was created and set up, and to to make you realize that this is a this is a um, global movement put together by people who are humanitarians, not politicians. We're only involved in this political arena because we are forced by default. Because if we don't get involved in this political arena and promote the the global philosophy of Ubuntu, which is a, very much a Southern African philosophy stronghold here f- for us. Uh, but we're using this philosophy of Ubuntu on a political platform to be heard and be seen and be the, the, the architects of change that bring in this true change for humanity and not just blowing hot air and rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic by trying to figure out how we're going to solve the problems with the same tools that created the problems in the first place. Exactly. And that's using yeah. money and, and this thing called economics, right? Absolutely. So, now, Michael agreed. And let's not, let's not forget your book, eh? I mean, you've, you've put together an entire book that explains us in, in huge detail. Um, yes. Is that also available on your website, or where can we find more information about that? Yes, the, the Ubuntu Contributionism book, it's called Ubuntu Contributionism, A Blueprint for Human Prosperity. It's 360 pages. It's an easy read. It's written for everyone so that it's, it's, it's little bite-sized chunks to absorb quickly and easily and, and not be bogged down with technical stuff because that's the problem. Um, my book is available uh, at uh, exclusive books in South Africa and other bookstores. Just ask for it. If they don't have it, they'll order it and have it in a few days. Or you can get it on Kalahari um, website. They stock, they stock it. You can get it on our Ubuntu website. You can also download the ebook, so you've got it on your computer and read it immediately. Um, and that will give you the full-blown philosophy, the history of money, the control of the banking, bloodlines. It's an interesting read because it's a real expose of how we ended up in the mess that we are in today, mm. why it is so bad, because it goes back not just hundreds of years, but actually thousands of years. And that's a big surprise to many people when they discover this. 
Yeah. So, no, yeah. And, and then obviously the most important thing about the Ubuntu contribution as a book, it provides the solutions. It doesn't harp on the negative stuff. There's That's enough negative stuff in the world. Yeah. yeah, it's the we good news. Gotta, we got to give people the good news and tell them that the solutions are simple. All of us actually actually have the solutions. People know how to solve the problems, but our politicians are getting in the way and our governments are getting in the way. And this is what we need to solve. Bring it back to the people. And Ubuntu is all about the people. Thank you. So it's Michael Tellinger for the Ubuntu Contributionism book, um, uh, www.ubuntuparty.org. Uh, .za. 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 Awesome. Um, Stephen Goodson, thank you. Thank you, Chris Scott. Excellent. It was a, it was really really great. It was. Uh, I'm glad you guys all took the time tonight. It's it's wonderful to have all four of you here, and uh, just to be able to do this to, to do this interview is is really just just a, a, been an amazing experience to to bring everyone together like this. Um, and to and to Louise as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scotty. And Sid. Thanks, Scotty. And Michael. All the best, eh? We'll be out there. Again, let's share this, guys. Share it to everybody. Michael Tellinger, thank you once again for all the work you've done. Thank you, Scotty. Thanks for uh, walking this walk. It's been well over three years now that we've been walking side by side, and it's just it's a, it's a great honor and a pleasure to have you and call you as a close friend um, of mine. So um, let's keep sharing this knowledge and information, and thank you for doing what you're doing with New Era to to be able to share this information with all your members. Absolutely. And to all the, those people listening to this that have been contributing to the campaign, printing flyers and t-shirts and translating your book into how many different languages um, and translating and recording voiceovers for the radio ads. And I mean, sure, Sid's done a huge amount of work, but all those other people there listening to this that have done that work, I mean, really, guys, you, without you, this would, this would be nowhere. And, and a huge thank you to them, them I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, so just before we go, Scotty, that's just another call to the people. You can download our, our posters. You can download our pamphlets on our website. If you have the, the, the uh, ability to do so, download the posters and the pamphlets and print them out and share them, um, distribute them, put them up, uh, help us spread the message of Ubuntu to as many people throughout South Africa as we can. Fantastic. Please do that, guys. And just if you don't want to even go that far, just hit the forward button and forward it to a whole bunch of people listening to this and ask them to listen to it because at the very least, the, this interview contains information that will spark some activations within you that can make some changes. So once again, guys, thank you so much and uh, all the best for the 7th of May. Thanks, Scotty. Speak soon. A historic moment. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.